One of the key aspects to find out initially is the patient's risk of bleeding. And you can split this up into two categories. So their risk of bleeding due to their medications or their medical condition, and their risk of bleeding due to the type of surgery. They might also be on other medications such as chemotherapeutic agents, and this can cause problems with bleeding. They may have medical conditions that can cause problems with bleeding, such as liver problems, renal problems, etc. So it's important to really have an understanding of that medical history of the patient. I'm going to focus on antiplatelets and anticoagulants and how we manage patients on these medications. Patients might be on a single antiplatelet such as aspirin or clopidogrel, or they might be on a combination, a dual antiplatelet, aspirin plus clopidogrel. It's quite common patients who've had an ACS or a myocardial infarct in the first six months that they'll be on a dual antiplatelet medication. So make sure you have an appreciation of why they're taking that medication. For all of these patients taking antiplatelets or anticoagulants, try and treat them in the morning, early in the week. Now it might be that first thing in the morning is not possible for them, but certainly as close to lunchtime as possible and early in the week. Because if they do have a bleed, you can then manage it either later that day or within the week. Treating patients on antiplatelets and anticoagulants at four o'clock on a Friday is not a bright idea because the weekend quite often it's difficult to access care. For these patients, I'm gonna to talk to you about local hemostatic measures as well. And I'll talk about those at the end, about which ones those are and who should be taking those. I'm also going to talk about local hemostatic measures where they're applicable and towards the end I'll talk to you about the different types of local hemostatic measures available and how they work. Patients taking a single antiplatelet medication don't interrupt their medication and treat them early in the day, early in the week. You probably won't need local hemostatic measures for these patients and in my clinical experience aspirin on its own for example don't tend to bleed very much at all. And consider limiting your treatment. So if it's extractions, probably we want straightforward extractions, three to four teeth. Patients who are taking clopidogrel or dipyridamol or prasugrel, in my experience, they do tend to bleed a little bit more. Now the guidance says consider local hemostatic measures. I think for these patients, I probably would err on the side of, of using local hemostatic measures to make sure that we get a nice clot. Patients who are taking dual antiplatelet medication, so two antiplatelets, I would definitely use local hemostatic measures. And again, the guidance says consider, but in my experience, they do tend to bleed quite a bit. And you want to limit their extractions and the procedure that you're doing. Patients who are on warfarin medication, which is an anticoagulant, it's a vitamin K antagonist, they should have a little yellow book or maybe a printout, and it will tell you one, why they're taking their warfarin, but two, what their target INR range is and the INR range is really important. Any patient taking warfarin, pre-surgery, we need to have an INR result, and it has to be less than four. If they've got a stable INR over the past few months, so it's not changed much, then you can get their INR within 72 hours of your surgery. If that INR result's a bit unstable, it's up and down, then ideally you want to get that within 24 hours. All patients taking warfarin, you should use local hemostatic measures. Remember with warfarin, there are many medications that can interact with it. So specifically, if you're prescribing things like antifungals, just be very cautious. Other medications such as antibiotics can also affect the patient's INR. If you have access to a coagi check machine, which is a finger prick blood test you can do in your clinic, and their INR is above four, then they need to go and see their dosing clinic and get their INR checked and redosed appropriately. Because if their INR is high, they might be at risk of a bleed. The other group of anticoagulants are called the direct oral anticoagulants, and these include apixaban, rivaroxaban, dabigatran. Now you'll notice that the first couple in the middle of the word, they've got XA, and that's because they are 10A inhibitors. Dabigatran is a thrombin inhibitor. Now these medications all have a really short half-life, and in the guidance, if the patients are taking these drugs twice a day, and you think the risk of bleeding is high risk because of the procedure, you can omit the morning dose, treat the patient, and then restart their dose later that day. Still use local hemostatic measures though, because when they restart their DOAC later in the day, if that clot isn't stable within the surgical site, it may get dislodged and they may have a bleed. So even though you've missed that morning dose, I would still pack and stitch. So what local hemostatic agents do we have available to us? There are a few on the market, and certainly oxidized regenerated cellulose is probably the gold standard. The trademark for the original one was Surgicel, there are a couple of others on the market, such as Curacel. So this works by having a, a mechanical effect in the socket by forming a scaffold for that clot. It also has a low pH, and this low pH therefore has antibacterial properties. 
but it can also be um, sensitive to areas like nerves. So if you're working in a lower third molar socket, for example, you've had a bleed, and you want to put some Surgisal in, that's fine, but don't push it right to the base of the socket just in case you cause any nerve injury. Surgicel dissolves in two to three weeks, by which point your clot's formed and the healing process is well underway. There are other ones on the market which are collagen sponges. They're great. They will form a scaffold again and they will activate the clotting cascade. And then there's some others on the market which are of animal origin. So whatever you're going to use, just check what that is, what properties it has, how it works, and that you might need to consent your patient appropriately, particularly if there's animal products in there. In addition to the local hemostatic measures that you put in the socket, you want to suture that in with a resorbable suture. I often call it a figure of eight suture, but you're basically forming a cross across the socket to keep that packing in, and you're encouraging a little bit of primary closure. You're not gonna get that socket closed primarily unless you undermine it. If you do that and raise a flap, you're gonna cause more bleeding, so I don't recommend that. But that stitch will just tie that socket nice and tight and keep that packing in, and it will all dissolve. So in summary, it's really important to know what medications your patient's taking, why they're taking them, and then assess the risk of bleeding. And that risk of bleeding is both the medication side and the patient's medical history, but also the surgical procedure that you're carrying out. Put them into one of those categories, and then that will dictate how you manage them. Thanks for listening.